Let's talk about Bloom filters today. One of those classic computer science slash system design concepts. Very important. So watch this video till the end. Let's start with an example. And this is the classic Bloom filter example. You have an auth system for a username and password. And you want to tell the user that if the username exists or does not exist. Today, we will talk about how to achieve this, that the login box tells the user that, hey, your username does not exist. Okay, let's start thinking approaches. You query the database with some SQL like this. And if the result of this SQL is empty, you say that the username does not exist. What would the database do now? If your table for some crazy reason does not have an index, it would go and do a full scan of the table or it will go over all the rows and check if your username matches with the condition. Well, this would be obviously too slow. So obviously that's bad. Let's say if your database has an index on most relational databases, the default index is a tree, a B tree. Now the database would search this tree for your Username. Now this would be a lot faster than if your database does not have an index, but it would still take a logarithmic time complexity to search this whole tree for your username. Can we make it better? We really don't want to waste so much resources in just checking if the username exists. So how can we make it faster? Think like this, which data structure can get me an element stored in it? in constant time, it can also tell me if an element exists or not in constant time. If you did some DSA, if you attended those algorithm class, you know that the answer would be probably hash set or hash map. Let's see an oversimplified version, a refresher on how a hash set or a hash map works. There would be an array, let's say of size 10, and you will have your username strings. You would use a hash function to get a number out of these strings. So you will pass these strings through this hash function and you will get a number. You will take that number and mod it by 10, which would give you the index to store the string in the array. So Sean goes through the hash function, it gives it six and it goes and sits here in this index. Now when retrieving the value, you will take the same username and pass it through the same hash function and you will check that index that, hey, I've got a value here. I've got the same value shown here. So, okay, my element exists. Now what happens when there is a collision or for two strings, my hash function yields the same result. Now there are several collision avoid techniques. Uh, we can do something like have a linked list as every element of the array and we can add uh, all the elements for that index on that linked list. The trade-off being, if there is a collision, we'll actually have to traverse the linked list and get the uh, value or check our element exists or not. But on average, there would be, it would be a constant time complexity. Now the hash set might seem to solve all our problems, but there is still an issue. We are storing all these strings, all these usernames. This needs a lot of space and space costs money. How can we reduce the space it needs? At this point, we have to make a choice, a trade-off. Do we always want the absolutely right answer every time if a username exists or not? Or can we do with a bit less accuracy because my database is anywhere there and we can check it there? Bloom filters is this choice where you sacrifice a bit of accuracy but you gain in a lot of space savings. Now, the only question we need to answer is, does an username exist? So why do we need to store the whole word, the whole username in our array? We can just initialize the whole array with zeros and just mark everywhere a username should be present as one. So when Sean got encoded to six, we will just store a one here. When Colby got I don't know, let's say uh, encoded to three, we would just put a one here. And when I'm searching for something, let's say I'm searching for Daniel, I'll go to the same hash function, it will point me to five, and I'll see the result is one. So my username exists. I can say that my username exists. If let's say I got zero, then my username does not exist. This is the foundation of Bloom filters. This is what Bloom filters is. Now, Look at this. We need only a bit to store each element. Unlike bytes we need needed to store each string, we need 
only a bit. So that's huge space savings. Now what happens if there is a collision? Let's say we want to search for this username Alex and when we pass it through hash function and we mod it by 10, we get the index 6. Now coincidentally, Sean is also encoded to 6, so the answer is 1. Now when we do this search, we say that, hey, this username exists, but this username Alex is not there in our original list. How do we solve this? Well, we can't. This is the trade-off we are making. In a Bloom filter, the answer is surely no or maybe yes. This is the sacrifice that we're making in accuracy to get a lot of space savings. So if it says yes, you still need to be aware when checking your username and password in the database, but it filters out a vast majority of invalid username requests, keeping your database load low. Although there are some ways to decrease the probability of failure, which is take more than one hash function and take your string, take get indexes from all these three hash functions and put a one there. When searching, go through all these hash functions again, check all these three indexes, and if all these three indexes have a one in them, then only my answer is yes, or maybe yes. This still does not give us a probability of 100%, but certainly increases the probability of success since three hash functions getting collisions for the same pair of strings is pretty low. Another trade-off that's harder to fight is that we cannot delete stuff from a Bloom filter. Now there is a paper which tries to do it, making some trade-offs. I would link the paper in the description. I got it from Arpit Vahani's uh, paper shelf page. So these Bloom filters can be used as an index in your databases like Postgres. Um, so if you have a use case like this, consider using a Bloom filter index also. All right, this was a bit about Bloom filters. If you liked the video, hit that like button, hit the like button, even if you didn't like the video, Hit the subscribe button for more cool engineering videos like this. See you in the next one.